Aloha mai kako. O vau o nalani. I will be your facilitator today. And welcome to our 2002 virtual summit and workshops, the April follow up. And you're in the session, Perspectives of a Backyard Mahi Ai, part two. We're so pleased to welcome back Kaiana Reynolds of the Kohala Center to share more about Mahi Ai and different ways to do this at home or wherever you live. Please welcome Kaiana. Oh, but first, let's um, hear from our moderator. My name is Heidi White Amal and I'll be your moderator for today. Nice to be with you guys today. Mahalo. Okay. Anoa ki aloha kako, o au kai ana Runnels, noho au ma lau pohoi hoi ka ahu po au ki halani. Uh, my name is Kai ana Runnels. I am from the ahu po of, of of ki halani in lau pohoi hoi in um, North Hilo Hilo Akau. Uh, mahalo for for joining this uh, this talk story today. Um, there is a little bit of a slideshow presentation where we'll dive a little bit deeper into Ike from the first papa. The first papa was really like surface level knowledge to engage your mind and to get you to start thinking about um, what what the universe of a mahi ai contains, yeah. Um, and this this papa will dive a little bit deeper into two specific um, meakandu Hawaii that are kupuna brought across the moana. Uh, we will dive a lot into kalo. That there's there'll be, there'll be a, a large emphasis on that. And then um, we'll also dip a little bit into Ava. We'll talk about um, color and Ava variety identification. We'll talk about some planting methods. We'll talk about some of the mo'olelo attached to the names of our color and our Ava. We'll talk about um, uses. We'll talk about a, a, lot, of, a lot of things that, that, um, that we didn't get to dive into in the, in the first round. So um, the title of this presentation, well, first of all, in the chat, if you could all please say where you're from, so we can site adapt some of this EK to you, whether, so that, that it'll give me an idea of where I know, so I can know where you're coming from. So yeah, just let's, let's see what the chat says, where you guys are from. Oh, awesome, there's the chat. Anai kani ohe o ahu maui kani ohe ahu manu kolo poko o imanalo eia nana kuli hilo kapolei anohola. Una, oh, Florida in the house. Makiki. Washington. Kauai. Ola. Hey, mahalo. Good. So we can definitely say, adapt some of this, this EK uh, to some of those places. All right. So the name of this, this presentation is called Ohaha. Where Aina and Kanaka flourish together. And so Ohaha is, is a term that I came across in some of my, my studies on um, just Mo'olelo Mahi Ai. And it has the root term of Oha, right? Which is the Ohana. And that Ohana gives you the visual of, of a kalo plant with a makua, yeah, or with two makua um, planted next to each other. Because in Hawaii, we don't do single, single plantings. We always plant kalo next to another plant. Um, next to another color plant. And so we have the two makua surrounded by oha. And ohaha contains in this word the imagery of a thriving color plant in a thriving state. So to the point where, where that color plant is so big and vigorous that it has tons of oha and there's plenty for everybody to go around. And so I like the name ohaha for this presentation because 
it, it gives us the imagery of, of what we should be able to be as a Lahui, as a people, um, and, and the abundance of food that should exist in Hawaii, and that hopefully um, will exist in the near future. And so Ohaha is the name of this presentation. Um, and there is a kalo variety called Kalalau. Uh, that's not the traditional name of this variety of kalo, but it's one that was rediscovered in Kalalau. And because the, the old name for it doesn't exist, uh, it, it received the name after where it was found. So certain color varieties we have in Hawaii, like Pololu, um, they, will, they will have these names attached to them because they don't match the descriptors of what we have in our puke that was left for us, some of the writings. And so we named that after where it was found. Um, just want to be able to honor Anakala Jerry Kononui, who um, was not only my kumu, but a friend. Um, and I am one of his um, many, many students and sons that he called. And um, yeah, I just want to be able to, to honor him. And this is a picture of, of at, at, we were at his house on, um, on this specific day. We were Ku'i Mana'ulu, the variety of, of Kalo right here. And this was, you know, it's funny because we were, uh, in my process of learning from him, he very gently said, he saw me kui one day and he was like, hey, I, I have a few things I can show you, which basically means that there's a lot I need to learn about kui, which was really cool. So he said, ah, why don't you come over to the house? And, and so I'd go over and um, this is what, what we learned. I learned a lot of Ike from him um, in the kui realm, but it, especially in the Kalo ID realm, because he, he knew I kind of already was well-versed in that because he'd been training me. And now he was opening me up into more um, aspects of, of Halwa. So this was at his Hale, and this was years ago. And you can see his Mo'opuna Hayden right here um, watching as we kui. Oh, kalamai, kalamai. Watching as we kui. And so there's Hayden. And, you know, later on down the line, Hayden comes to all of my classes. And, and you know, it's an interesting transfer of knowledge from Uncle Jerry to me and all of his other students and sons. Um, and now we get to pass that Ike on to Hayden, his Mo'opuna. And then here's Hayden in this class, helping to teach the other students, other high school students in, in this class, how to kui. And so when we talk about this transfer of knowledge from generation to generation, it's, uh, it's really important that whatever you learn, especially here today and throughout your kilo and your experience in your hana with halwa and other meakanu, that you, you pass on that knowledge to, to whoever is next and you freely share. In Hawaii, we, we believe, especially nowadays, that, that Ike is freely given and freely shared. So, yeah. This is our aina at Namoku in Honoka'a, where we hold a kalo collection of over 100 varieties of kalo. We have uh, many kalo from Hawaii and through the South Pacific um, into you know, even Micronesia, Malaysia, up through, up through um, actual Asia in, in Japan and China, some of their varieties, their heirloom varieties as well. And so, um, yeah, we won't go into this video. This is just a video that, that has a, a view of all of the, the varieties, but it takes a little bit of time. And we're gonna skip that for now. So one thing I wanted to focus on today is the significance of Haloa in your Ohana. And the reason I think this is important is because Haloa, when you think about Haloa, we all understand the concept of it being sticky and you know you have to watch your language and, and, and the way you act around Haloa from, from kanu, from planting, to huki, to kui, um, to consumption, right? When that, when that umeki is open, um, the language changes, the, the mood in the room changes to a happy, luck, um, happy and and just um, le -a -le -a is, is the term. Um, but because it's sticky as well, it also has that ability to bind and it binds families together. I've noticed that, you know, when, when Ohana gather around and prep Aina together, when Ohana gather around and, and Kanu, Kalo together, plant the Huli, when Ohana gather around and, and Huki together, which is what you're seeing in this image right here is a, a Kalo Huki day we were, we were doing during COVID and we were able to Huki um, over a thousand pounds of ai out of the field 
I give all of that food away and all of the huli of every variety that exists um, that we know of in Hawaii. And so, yeah, when, when ohana huki together, when ohana kui together, and when ohana consume poi together at the poi bowl, that is how you bind ohanas together uh, on a deeper level. Um, I think we've lost as a people the importance of the, the, the umeke or the kalamania, the, the, the big poi bowl in the middle of the table and how important those conversations and bonding time across that poi bowl are. Whether it's your ohana, winding down from the day, how was school, how are you feeling? Um, what's your favorite part about our mala? You know, what, what did you do in the mala today? Um, what trees do you think you wanna plant in the, in the future? Those kinds of stories are what occur around, around the table. And even when you host um, friends, hoa, other ohana, that poi bowl should be the gathering place, yeah? Um, and so oh, uh, Haloa binds Ohana together, but also we talked about ohan, um, Haloa symbolizing Ohana in every aspect of, of that term. The root term of Ohana is also Oha. And so, yeah, Ohana, Haloa, we all descend from Haloa. And something I like to, to remind everyone is we've all heard the, the story of, of, of Haloa and our origins and how, and how we come from him. But when you think of the mo'oku auhau of, of Haloa, and you think of Papa and Wakia, and you think of, well, there's multiple genealogies that, that, that we found in our hui of, of Haloa, that it's not just Papa Wakia, Ho'ohoku, Kalani, Wakia, Haloa. There's been multiple genealogies that have vari variations in that, in that genealogy. And so uh, when you think about Ho'ohoku Kalani, though, and that way that she did to, to Kanu, her baby on the eastern side of her house, that baby Alu Alu, and she uwe over that baby. That type of uwe that she did, that type of crying that she did, there's a term for it. And the term you come across most often is halo iloi. And halo iloi, if you look at that word, there's already words you can pick out in that word that will give you an idea of what was occurring there. When ho'oho kukalani ha lo'i lo'i, she was crying so much that, that her tears were creating these, these puddles that we refer to as lo'i. And so if you think of ho'oho kukalani as planting ha'loa in the ground and then watering it with her tears and creating lo'i, she now is the first mahi'ai that we know of. And if you all descend from her, you are all mahi'ai as well. And so I'm really excited to share this ike with you because it's ancestral ike from the very beginning of who we come from and in, in the Hawaiian realm, in the Hawaiian perspective. And so I, I think that it's important for you to remember that you come from a long line of mahi'ai when you're, when you're gearing up to, to, uh, to make your mala or to improve your mala. So um, we're going to jump into some of the kupuna kalo. This was a, a planting that we did maybe last year. Uh, the bottom on the left here is the same field that is on the right here. And um, this actually wasn't even the peak of what the kalo became. And these are all, again, uh, Hawaiian heirloom varieties mixed in with some South Pacific varieties. And um, yeah, it just shows the potential of what, you know, was and what can be if we just give it a little bit of aloha and a little bit of hana. So when you're walking up to a kalo plant to identify it, the first thing that you're gonna, I remember being with the Uncle Jerry in the, in the Malam, and we would we would walk up to, to one of the color varieties and we'd be kind of far away from it, maybe you know, 30 to 40 feet away from the color plant. And on a color Jerry would say, Who's that? And I'd look and I'd be like, looks like a low law. He's like, why do you say that? I was like, oh, I can see the long the long leaf. And so he goes, my kai, my kai. We take a step forward, one step forward. And he'll tap me and he'll go, now who's that? And I'm like, oh, looks like a lau loa keo keo. And he'll say, why is that? And I'll go, oh, because the, the ha, I can see the, the color of the ha telling me lau loa keo keo, letter green ha. Oh, my kai. We take another step forward. Now who you think is that? I was like, oh, actually, I'm going to change my mind. Looks like, looks like maybe I can see the black lihi and the, 
By the time we get up to the color, we've named over 40 descriptors that narrow down that color to who it is. And to me, that level of learning was so important because I got to learn every intricate detail of who our, our color are and not just their traits because all of us have traits, right? You all on this Zoom have, have height, have your eye color, have your hair color, have there's multiple traits that we can we can come to to narrow you down to who you are but more important than our traits that define us it's our it's our home right where we come from who we are what we like to do yeah who we like to grow next to what we like to eat yeah what we don't like same with our color things that define them are not just their their physical traits which are important but also that there, there are other traits why are they named that yeah why do they contain all that kauna within one name? Are there multiple names for that variety? Where do those varieties come from? Who do they like to grow next to? What do they like to eat? Yeah. And so that's why being able to identify your color is critical. And we'll learn some of these traits here in, in this, this Zoom today. But the reason why that's important is because the name will tell you everything you need to know about your color. And, and you know what's interesting is Uncle Jerry would always say, you know, if I couldn't figure out who it was, because some Kalo are perfectly identical, they will look exactly the same. And the only difference there will be is when you cook it and you kui it, one poi is, is yellow and one poi is white, right? Or one poi is slightly off white and one poi is white. And so he would just tell me, just, just relax. The Kalo will tell you who it is. And, and that's something I've learned to, to accept as well, because, you know, the physical traits of Kalo, while we, we want them in our scientific brain to be consistent traits, no matter where we go, they're not. If you were to take me and plant me up in Ola'a, where some of you are from, I would look a little bit different, right? The, the sun doesn't shine as much up there, a lot of rain. Uh, my skin might come a little more pale than it is in Hamakua, North Hilo. And, and so our color are different as well. If we move them around this mokupuni and around other mokupuni across the paiaina, they're gonna put on different traits. I call them ahu or, or different cloaks that they'll put on. And so while it's important to know all the different cloaks that each variety can wear, it's, it's more important to know what that variety looks like in your aina and, and how that color speaks to you. So when you're looking at a color just on the low alone, we have the pico color, shape, size, the leaf shape, size. Is it ovate, real round, or is it real arrowhead, pointed, sagittate looking? What are the angles of the lobes? Are they acute? Are they obtuse? What is the sinus cut down here to the pico? Is it real shallow like our kais and our iliwawa, or is it real deep like our pico ohana? Yeah. And then we have the, the low, the, the kai low. The, the edge of the low, um, does it have a color? The, is it waving? Are there undulations? Is it real tight waves like our Asian varieties or real long, mellow waves? Um, what is the, the primary Y vein look like in that vein? There's, is there a color in it? Is it just green or is it off green? Is it yellowing? Is it white? Um, looking at the secondary veins, yeah, these a, a low. And so that's just on the low alone. And then you flip the low over and you have a whole new group of descriptors on the back where the ha meets the low. What does that apex looks like? Is there a sinus line on the back of the ha, um, on the back of the low? And then you work into the ha and then you look inside the ha and you see the webbing and these intricate colors in the webbing and these stripes and some of the varieties in the webbing. And then you look at the kohina and that blows you away because the kohinas are just a really important descriptor that we should know, which is where the huli meets the eo right here. Um, you look at, does it have runners, right? Does it have these little, these little runners or stolons we call them? Or does it have oha, suckers, are they attached to the mama? Um, and, you know, just an interesting fact is that every kalo variety, if you throw it in the wangunahele, if you throw it in the, the forest, will re revert back over time to its original ancestor that does have runners. And so even color, if you see oha, that it's more of a domesticated color, right? It's been cultivated for years and years. Um, but if you throw any of those back in the forest, they'll, they'll throw their runners again. Um, then you look at the core. 
the ilikana, you scrape the skin off and you see that color underneath the skin. You look at the, the corn color, the fiber color. What color poi does it make? What color does that poi look like two days from when you kui? What color does that poi look like you know, four days from that kui? You look at the makas, the little eyelets on the corn. Um, what is the pattern on them? What do they look like? And so there's, there's tons of these traits that you can narrow down um, to determine who your kalo is. And I just want to expose you to some of the ohana that we have. Um, kalo, like kanaka, were placed in ohana. And when you look at ohana, you, you, you know, a lot of you will share the same traits as your makua, as your kupuna, are kalo are the same way. They share a lot of the same traits as members of their ohana. Sadly, a lot of our kalo have lost major parts of their ohana, um, but we still have some pretty well intact. Not entirely, but pretty well intact. And so the posters you're looking at here, I created to just help with educational purposes to, to expose people to what these ohana look like in general, characterizing traits that, that define these ohana. And what you have on the left side here is our mana ohana. And this is not the whole mana ohana, this is just a piece of it. Only four varieties could fit on the poster. So, uh, you know, one thing that classifies these mana ohana really well is if you look at this mana opelu here at the top, if you look at the corm or the i'o, yeah, it has the corm right here, and then it has all of these ha coming off the corm. And these are makua, these are not oha, these are actual makua. And so that defines this ohana. Now, it doesn't always throw mana. Like if you look at the mana ulu, it's not mana ing, if that's a term. But what, what, you can, what you can look at to tell you that it is a mana as well is these makas right here. Those little eyelets on the corn. They always come out in the mana family with two or three or four right, at, right next to each other. Whereas every other variety will have one, 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 right? Or one spiraling down or one in a straight line. And so that's, that's one way you can tell it's a mana. Our mana ohana have many members of the family. Um, mana ulu, mana opelu you see here are two of our uh, handful of kalo that make yellow poi. So when you kui kalo and you go to the store, okay, we'll see. You go to the store, go to KTA, um, go to wherever you, you buy your poi from and type in the chat, what color is the poi that you buy in the store? I'd love to hear your response. And I'm not saying the color you make at home because I know some of you have these varieties, but what color is the ones purple? There you go. And gray, we're done. That's it, purple and gray. So if it's purple, it's usually Maui Lehua or a hybrid off of Lehua. And if it's gray, it's usually Moi, Moi Kea or Moi uh, Ula Ula, which is typically from Kauai, okay? And so there is danger in, in commercializing these two varieties to an extent um, because when we lost the biodiversity because of the kalo industry, um, it didn't become as profitable to grow some of these other varieties because it was ruining their poi mill because they were so pa'a. Or they were, um, you know, if one of you were going to KTA and you saw poi on the shelf and that poi was brown, or what if you went and saw poi on the shelf and it was yellow? Or if you saw poi on the shelf and it was blue? Or it was fluorescent green? Some people would have a hard time buying that kind of poi. And so they narrowed it down to two simple colors, purple and gray, two vigorous varieties that used to be vigorous that are having trouble now. Um, but it's just, there's power in diversification because some of these kalo have flavors that you've never tasted before. They have nutrients that our bodies have never received before. And so it's important for us to, I, I tell my students, taste the rainbow. Yeah, try every color that you can, every variety of poi. They all have amazingly different flavor profiles. Something like Faifa'ausi from Samoa has this, it makes a fluorescent green poi and it has this pistachio nutty flavor that um, you know, we've, nobody's really tried. And so get used to, to trying some of these varieties if you can. That's, that's one thing that I would say. If you get anything out of this, try to get used to that. Um, we didn't talk about the other ohana. So, let me try to move this chat out of this screen. Okay, so the mana ohana, the first, the first name will tell you what it grows like, right? It can mana, it can branch out like your mana mana lima. 
And then the second name will give you a little hint as to what it was used for, what it looks like. So mana opelu. I remember when we were doing a class um, in Pahala, and um, one of the kupuna down there was was in that papa, and his name was Akochaki, and he was a opelu um, lavaya. And when he saw this color variety, we were talking about it. His eyes lit up. And they just got big. He was in the way back of the class. And I looked at him and I said, Uncle, you, you know this, this, I know this color. He's like, oh, yeah. I said, oh, how, how come? And he goes, oh, that's the best palu. And, you know, these kupuna that are in um, Miloli'i and, and Ka'u talk about, they don't really like the term fishing. And I didn't understand why. And then I, I you know, through talking to some of these kupuna, they, they would say that the term fishing is used to not be a thing because they would have the mana opelu as the palu. And they would take that out and they would hanai the opelu and hanai and hanai. They would feed, feed, feed. And they wouldn't even have the thought in their brain to bring fish back. They would go feed, feed, feed. And then when they wanted to have the fish give back in return, right? That idea of reciprocity. They keep the palu in the va'a and the opelu jump in for them. And so it's this concept of we hanai and they hanai. And so it's one of those things where, you know, shifting our mindset to be um, fishing, right? Or, or are we hanai, right? Do we hanai or do we fish? And so it's one of these... Um, these things, even with the soil, right? Are we taking as much as we can from our soil or do we hanai the soil? And in turn, that soil, that lepo, hanais our kalo. And then the kalo in return can hanai us. Um, it's just this idea of reciprocity as a mahiai, yeah? Um, mana opelu is what they use for the, the, the bait, for the opelu fish. Our pico ohana, well-known ohana, yeah? All the sinuses cut down deep into the pico, right down to that, that, that pico in the leaf. And that happened because uh, in our windy areas where we grow kalo, uh, in Hawaii Island, I know, uh, you know, somewhere down more South Point side, perhaps up in, in Kohala, where they're famous for pico kea and other varieties, where that makani whips so hard, it just tears the leaf and tears the leaf. And when the leaves on the kalo tear, yeah, can you see this? Let me see if, I, if you're pulling up on the computer. Oh, you can't see it because it blends in with the background. Maybe you can turn off the background real quick. One second. I'm going to try to turn off the background. Video. None. Perfect. Okay. When this color leaf this leaf is from a, a variety called um, mana laulo. And when this leaf hits the heavy wind, the natural breaker for the leaf, the natural breaking point is right there down the middle. Yeah, it tears. And every time that wind comes, it tears and tears and tears again. I think we're good. Yeah, mahalo. Um, and every time that, that wind comes, it just keeps tearing. And so over time, what happens is that 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 Kalo says, you know what? I'm tired of being torn every day. And so it comes out with its leaf already torn. And that's how we got the, um, uh oh, that's how we got the Pico Ohana because they come out already torn. So the second part of the Pico Ula Ula family, the Pico Uaua, the Pico Uli Uli, the Pico Keo Keo, the Pico Kea, the Pico Ele Ele, they're all just descriptors of what that, that color will look like. So pico, it'll be cut down to the pico, and then the second part is a descriptor of what it should look like. And all of our pico have a variant name. They're called hai hai. So if you think of hai, you think of the hai Hawaii, right? That flag whipping in the wind. Um, some of us on this Mokupuni think of kawaii hai, that whipping waters down at kawaii hai. Um, and that's, that, that's a proof that this color is, is wind resistant. It also has a really firm ridge on the back of its, its spine on its kua to hold it in the makani. But there's so many ohana 
There's a ula ula ohana uh, that had other ohana of its own traditionally, but now we smash them together because they've lost a lot of the members of their family. Our ele ele ohana, which is, you know, an amazing ohana. They also make really red poi. Um, our ohana manini, all the striped colors that we have. Um, but not all striped colors are maninis, but a lot of our maninis are, are um, every manini will have a, a stripes on it. Um, so if you look at the manini kalo and you think about our lavaita, um, manini is the name of a fish and that fish has those stripes on it that, that most of you know. And so these are what we used if we had to nini, if we had to appease the, the nini, the anger of a God um, that, that, and we didn't have the kalo, we could use, I mean, we didn't have the fish, we could use the kalo. And so a lot of our kalo, you'll notice, will have fish names. And, you know, when you're reading the Mo'olelo of Kamehameha, um, when he was run over by Naole to Kohala, he was hiding up in the mountains. And they talk about him eating a specific food. And the food that, that Kamehameha was raised on is kai'aivi ole. So the, the fish with no bones. And on the surface level, you think, oh, smart. They took the bones out of the fish so he wouldn't choke so that he could live, right? And fulfill that prophecy that was given about him. And then when you peel back the layers and you think of Kohala and the abundance of Kalo it produced, and you think about all of our Kalo having variant names that have reference to fishes, it gives a new light on a fish with no bones, right? Kaiva, kaiva ivi ole. Um, and what Kamehameha might have been raised on. Was it really a literal fish with no bones or was it poi and kalo, um, which is another way to eat and consume that fish, yeah? And so this is just some mana'o that, that go along. Lauloa ohana, all have real long leaf. Um, and, and those, this is the one of the few ohanas that will tell you exactly what the kalo will look like. And um, lauloa ke o okay, our most medicinal kalo. Um, then we have some of these over here that I just threw in for fun. Avel Vel is our wild color that you find in the forest. And for those of you that Levite are, you're like, Avel Vel, this color, the ha is green. Avel Vel in the kai is not green, right? But then as I was diving, as I was lu'u, I would kilo the Avel Vel and say, hey, why does this fish have a color form? And when you're looking at the fish in the kai and you watch them, especially in the daytime, yeah, they come, they, they stay in these dark caves with the uu, um, people call them in pachi, yeah, and they stay with them, big eyes, and they come out and they look around and they go back in and they come out and they look around and then they go back and hide. And our avelvel kalo in the wild does the same thing. It will peek its head out of the forest for a little while and then go back in and hide and then peek out a little bit and then hide. And so looking at these fish and these color relationships, there's so many reasons why these color got fish names. And you just kind of have to, to peel back the layers of the kauna to figure out why, why that is. Um, elepayo ha uli uli, there's an elepayo ha kea, there's an elepayo valeno, right? There's an elepayo. And, you know, Bulletin 84, which is a great resource to have, says that Elepayo got its name because of the, the spots under the Elepayo's wings. But only one island's Elepayo has that spots. So what else could Elepayo mean? Right? Elepayo is the word, and, and I got this from a good friend um, that lives on Oahu in, um, in, in Haiku. He said that, the elepayo is the term we use for the Milky Way. And when you look at this elepayo low, you see the reflection of the lani, of the leva, on the surface of the low, right? It's the reflection of the Milky Way on the leaf. So there's so many layers to the mana'o there. Our royal red ohana, which is not a real like thing. We just call it that and group them together because these are all color that make um, red poi. And they don't kui red, they kui like a dark pink. And then you let that thing poha, and then it starts to hoo, starts to rise and ferment. Then it becomes red. And some of these were ali'i kalo. Yeah, some of these were the kalo that are ali'i preferred. Pi'i ali'i we know was kapu ali'i. And so um, 
Then we have our kalo lao pi'i, kalo with crinkles in the lao. The, the, the background behind some of the, the moderators here is from a variety called apuai. And apuai and apu, those two sisters, they catch the, the fresh water. And this was one of the most sacred waters in Hawaii. Um, second to Waiyao and some of our other sacred waters, but, but at least accessible to Makainana everywhere. This vai was, uh, we call it the, the vai ha ule ole, the vai that has not yet touched the earth. And it was used by kahuna la'au lapa'au to make the most potent medicines. And so, yeah, kalopa'akai, crinkled lau. Not as crinkled as apu and apuai, but crinkled. Um, are only that we know of right now, salt tolerant kalo um, that can handle growing on the lihikai by the local i'a. Um, on Molokai, they have a famous planting method called lana kapapa, where they plant kalo on these floating rafts of hau lashed together. And pa'akai is what you grow on that. It can handle that brackish water environment. So if you get anything else out of this presentation, just get that our kupuna were brilliant scientists in. in and in, in the, the idea that they created and site adapted all of these varieties, mostly by somatic mutation, by kahuli, which means they brought the first kalo from kahiki or wherever it came from. And say they kanu that kalo, um, and I'm sorry, because I'm thinking in the realm of moku kiabe, say they kanu that kalo in keokaha or waipio, where it's close to the ocean that kalo will look a little bit different than it did from where it came from. And then you take that same variety and you go and you plant it up in Ola'a and it will start to, to grow a little bit longer, mature a little bit slower, put on different traits. Over time, multiple generations, that becomes a new variety, a stable variety. And then they take that variety, they take it to Ka'u, yeah? Where Nalani's from, um, that, that more drier part of Ka'u, not the wetter side, the drier side of Ka'u. And it takes on a whole new trait. And then you take it from there to Kona, plant it in the Pohaku, whole new tree. Take it from Kona, plant it up Kohala, right? Starts to Pico, starts to get that ridge, whole new tree. So that, that knowledge, as they said, adapted these varieties, is the most impressive thing. And their legacy lives on today. That's why it's important to Malama these varieties. Because every Huli that you touch is a direct descendant from a Huli that your ancestor touched, yeah? Here's another glimpse into some of the, the kalo of Hawaii. Um, you can ignore the kahuli poster for now. That's not what we're going to focus on. But we'll focus on um, lihi lihi molina. Yeah, this little eyelash crescent in the corn. That doesn't always happen. Some people are like, oh, I, I cut it and never have. It's not. No, it is. Just be patient. That crescent takes time to show itself. And it doesn't always show itself. Even for the the... The people who have been growing lihilihimoni lihi for years. Uh, this color almost was Nalo Valley for a while. And then Uncle Jerry was able to find a little oha, repropagate it. And now it's probably one of the most prevalent color you'll see in Hawaii. Um, Queen Emma mentioned this color as one of her, her cherished favorites in her, um, in her journal. And it's a really, really special color. It makes a beautiful light gray poi. Wahia Pele, the smoke of Pele, yeah. There's a wahia pele sugarcane, wahia pele uwala, um, and this wahia pele has kauna in it as well. Um, a few things I've noticed is that when the sun is rising and the sun is setting, and you see that sun come through the back of the lau, that is the same image as when you're up at the lua pele, hale ma'u ma'u, and the wahi covers the sky, that smoke covers the sky, and the sun peeks through the back of that smoke. Yeah. It's the same exact image you'll get when that sun is rising behind the wahia pele leaf. Um, the poi make, it's a smoky gray color poi. Um, and I've even had it taste like a smoky flavor when it wasn't even in a emu. It was just in a steamer, yeah. Um, pretty amazing. And so, yeah, these are just some of the, the, the things. There's an image of, of what the sun looks like behind wahia pele. Um, so, before we get into Ava, let's get a few questions in the chat or, or, or open your mic up and ask. I actually prefer that. Um, and feel free to like ask questions that are relevant to your mala 
feel free to ask questions about color varieties and identification in general. Um, I think this is a good breaking point to, if you want to stand up and take a break, fine. But like, if you can stay, let's get some questions going and see what you guys are thinking about. Just kind of gauge your temperature right now. I have a quick question. Yep. Um, my Kiki go to private school and I've been partnering with them this year to introduce uh, native plants and farming. They have like an eco garden. And so we just were talking about introducing Kalo. Um, they're up in Mililani on Oahu. So it's kind of um, not very wet all the time, but what would you recommend for maybe an easier kala variety for kiki to plant and malama themselves and be able to harvest in school? Oh, good question, good question. Um, so the first thing I would recommend is to dive into some of the research and see what plants, what, what varieties grew there traditionally. And then the second thing I would recommend is to, to do a trial. And so what that entails is just getting a bunch of these varieties and planting them and, and you kilo and you see who stands out above the others, uh, who looks like they're happiest. There are certain kalo that prefer nice ice cold water from the, from the po'o of the lo'i, but for the most part, a lot of these kalo varieties will thrive in multiple locations. And so, um, yeah, my, my, my recommendation is to, is to try. You know, here's a story I can give you. Uh, when I moved from Oahu. I used to live on Oahu in, in Haula. And when we moved from Haula to Ola'a, originally, when we, when we came to this Mokupuni, um, I was already really close to Uncle Jerry. and We had already been training on Oahu when he would fly out there. And when I came here, I, I, I sent him a text. I said, hey, Anakala, I'm moving to Ola'a. You live right down the road from that in Pahoa. What varieties should I bring with me? To, to thrive up there in Ola. High elevation, right, right, almost 2,000 feet, real cold, real anu anu. And, and I was expecting for this long reply of like all the traditional varieties from Ola, which we, we know who they are. And, and talking about which ones do best today and, and why. And his reply was very simple. And it was three words. The words were, let me know. And what that meant to me was that he's not out to give easy answers, is that he wanted me as a haumana to work for it and then let him know. And he would confirm that if that's what I came up, up with. And so I brought all the varieties, right? Packed a whole cooler of just huli, one of each variety that I brought with us, um, planted every single one, and I was able to verify that ike kupuna. So there's power in, in trying that. Um, on Oahu, there are places you can get these varieties. You said you were on Oahu, right, Kalamai? I up in Mililani. Mililani, okay. You might have to drive a little bit, um, but I know Waimea Botanical Gardens <laughs> has around 60 to 70 kupuna kalo, and, and uh, you can get in touch with some of the people there and let them know the, the intent of your project. I'm sure they'd be willing to share. There's also places in um, Haiku that, that have kalo collections all across the island. So um, yeah, that's what I would recommend is try to get your hands on as many as you can and, and try it out in, in Kilo. That will reveal um, to you who grows best there. Mahalo. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I see one right here. Kialani. Oh, oh Ivalani, um, these posters are not available. I've, I've just printed one out for me. I created them actually during college when I was really broke, still am, but when I was more broke. And um, I would just do one every every time we'd get a paycheck, I, I'd print one out. And so they're not like a thing, they're just a tool I created um, to use. So call them my, yeah, there's not, they're not available. But, you know, they'll be available on this, uh, this site now. There's a lot more posters that weren't on the slides. I had to, I had to cut everything down to fit it in, um, but yeah. How to rest the mala following the harvest. Good idea. Crop rotation is critical for kalo. Kalo pest buildup is like 
a big problem today. Um, our kupuna never had to deal with things like leaf blight, um, pocket rot for the corn, leaf hoppers that delf aphids, the, the, the jumping little bugs on your plants that hide in the ha, aphids that come with ants. Um, they didn't have to deal with any of that, which is crazy to think, but we do. And so what a blessing it is to have that challenge in our life and become creative uh, to figure out how we can best malamahalo in, in this modern day. It's, it's really fun. And so what I would recommend is definitely rotating your beds. Um, after kalo, follow it up with something that doesn't share the same pest as, as kalo. Um, and then follow, it, follow that up with a, just a cover crop of plants you're willing to put back into the soil as a sacrifice um, so you can regrow the kalo in it. Um, I would say that, that that's a good practice. If you're really struggling with, with pest buildup while you've planted already, the best way I've found to get rid of these pests, if you can safely do it, is to wait after you plant your huli, wait till the third leaf emerges. And that part is critical. Wait till the third leaf emerges out of your plant. So you have, you plant the huli, the first leaf will come out, second leaf, third leaf starts to come out. And as it starts to unravel, stack your whole mala with dried lau, lau malo, your dry ulu leaves, your dry maia leaves, your dry hapu'u fern, your dry uluhe, that stuff is gasoline, and flash burn your whole mala to the ground. And you're going to think I'm crazy. This is Ike Kupuna. This is not me. And we've done it many times. And it just looks like a field of ash when it's done. And then two days later, these little green slimy things start poking out of the ground. And every single color grows back. A hundred times more vigorous, completely pest-free and healthy because of the ash. Um, that has been the most efficient way. People spray ni oi and neem and soap and it's just you know to do that in a in a bigger color patch it is not worth your time flash burn it do, don't put wood nothing woody you don't want to make it a prolonged burn where it burns this, where it heats the soil flash burn it it'll grow back promise good question uh what soil nutrients are good to put in the soil um plants that's where i'll start plants a good cover crop is the best thing. A tall, sugary grass like sorghum or sudex, a smaller mid-story nitrogen fixer like crotillaria, sun hemp, um, a, a low-level broadleaf plant like a daikon radish that breaks up compaction, that, comes, that kills nematodes. Mustard is a good one. And then a real low, creepy ground covery um, cowpea, it could be perennial peanut, anything that will, will ground cover that ground, and then put all that back into the soil and let it, let it sit there. Um, the best medicine, though, traditionally for, for kalo is going to be um, kukui. We look in, in all of our documents and kukui. People say how, people say that's all my kai, but kukui is the best by far. Pa kukui is the method of planting used in hamakua, where they dig a big lua, and they chop all the branches, they bolo head all the kukuis and toss them in the lua. And then they cover it with soil, with lepo. They'll go back three months later, four months later, pull out the branch. If the branch still has kukui leaves on it, let it go a little longer. When you pull out the branch and all the leaves are gone, you kanu your kalo, and it will be the biggest kalo you grow. Um, I understand some of you are working with places with no soil, but can, can. Yeah, there's, there's places like um, Ola'a, Kona, some places in Ka'u, even Hilo, where you're working with two to three inches of soil and can. There's, there's multiple methods that you can use to, to employ there. If you're working with just a few inches of soil, you can plant your huli in a hina style, which is, um, here, I'll, I'll show you real quick. So this is mana lau loa. You see how it's mana ing? It's branching off the same corn. Uh, what I want to do is just show you real quick how to... Um, Strip and yeah. So we went through some of the cleaning huli process in the first video. But what I want to do is just show you right here. Okay, so if it's like this, I recommend just leaving this new shoot on as long as you're not worried about the pests in your garden. Because leaf hoppers can hide in here, but I like to leave that on. And so if this is your huli.
what I recommend doing if you have no soil is planting your huli in this hina style, where you're lying it down like this and your soil is right here. And what that will do, and this tip is sticking up out of the ground, what that will do is it'll allow your kalo to grow up and out. As opposed to planting it straight up and it grows up and it's already out of the soil, when that sun hits that corm, it becomes loli loli. It turns the starches into sugars and it doesn't ferment right when you kui it. You can't kui it because it's all he he he, it's all, it's all watery. You grow it like this, okay? And then it grows up. That's how I used to grow them in Ola'a. That'll grow up and out. So two inches of soil can. It grows up and out. And you have these, these corms shaped like nuku, like beaks. And um, you get a lot more ai than planting it straight in the ground. On pohaku, you know, Uncle Jerry talks about all the old stories he, you know, from Uncle Jerry come to mind of, of watching his kupuna from Kona throw huli on the ground and kicking pohaku over it. And, um, and they got me eye because the pohaku would catch the rain, drop that rain to that, to that huli, and it would grow. Um, and in some places where there was a lot of hala trees, they would practice pahala, where they cut down all the hala trees, hoa, light them on fire, and then kanu that huli in the ash and drop more hala on top for mulch, and they would get softball-sized kalo. And that's lo'ak me'ai, right? That's the main thing, you get food. So yeah, there's always a way to grow it. Nutrients in the soil. I'm not a big fan of amending with like all kinds of like nitrogen and um, yeah, I think if you can get it from plants, that's the best way to do it. Yeah. All right, anything else before we move on? Oh, there's more, more questions. What is a Kalo library? Sounds interesting. Yaka, could you uh, that mana'o a little bit more? I'm not sure what I talked about at that point. Um. Oh. Well, I just was responding to um, Analea. She was talking about they have a Kalo library in North Shore and Haleiwa. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, oh, I would love to see that. That that's um, I do have my own. I, if you're talking about books per se, I do have a really cool collection as well. But I, I'm always like interested in in that. So, I'll be on Oahu at some point. We usually go for the Waimea Kalo and Aba Festival. I'd love to come and and um, and see that if if you're willing. And I'll bring some of the the varieties that you're on the for to plant. Yeah, mahalo for that. We have a question from Dutch. He asked, where can he find resources to gain knowledge of what plants were grown traditionally in the specific areas? Good, good, good question. Um, the best way to do it is talk to the kupuna who are there. A lot of those kupuna have great memories of what varieties their grandparents grew, what varieties their parents grew, They'll tell you exactly uh, who used to grow there traditionally. Um, if that doesn't exist, then there are books you can look into, which are not, you know, the best way to find information, but it, it is a way. And um, some of those books that will benefit you are Bulletin 84 that we talked about from Bishop Museum. It will be Handy, um, Hawaiian Planter, which is the predecessor to Native Planter. It's like the first um, edition of that book before they refined it. And I would say um, there's a Taro Varieties document from Emerson and McAfee. Um, it's not as good about telling you where, but I would say that Hawaiian Planter and B84 from Bishop Museum are the best two sources right now. There, there is a, a book in the works by um, Anti Penny Levin and some of the other Kalo people coming out, that's a revision to the Bulletin 84, that will be like the Kalo Bible, essentially. But that's not, it's not there yet, so, yeah. All right, any other questions? Any Anyone have questions about their own mala, like actual things that are occurring right now that they're curious about? Um, that's, that's like the best kind of questions, or general questions in, uh, re referring to kalo planting methods, um, varieties, anything like that that you guys want to to learn about? 
Yeah, my uh, my kalo got transplanted and it started shooting out pua and I wasn't very uh, prepared for that. Oh, that's, <laughs> and I heard that's, that's not a good thing. Nah, nah, that's okay. Um, yeah, let's let's hit that a little bit. That's fun. Yeah. So, okay, kalo pua. You know, years ago, Uncle Jerry used to say, man, he was frustrated with the UH scientists because he was like, man, they always tell me, man, the kalo never flowers because they were trying to hybridize the kalo, what they still kind of are, but um, they were trying to hybridize the kalo then and they were like, yeah, the kalo rarely flowers. And it's just not true. That's not true. And so there are ways to get kalo to flower. Now, now what I will say is kalo will flower naturally around the summer solstice. So if it's flowering right now, there's a different reason why. But summer solstice, you're going to see that your whole mala will be covered in beautiful pua. I will usually gather them all and make my wife a bouquet of, of pua kalo. And she loves that. Um, people think it doesn't have a, a fragrance. It does have a fragrance. It does smell really, really nice. It's subtle, but it's nice. Um, now, there's other ways to get kalo to flower. Um, kalo will flower. It is a sign if, sometimes. It will flower if it's in compacted soil. It will flower if it is um, in too much shade. It will flower if, if it has too much nutrition. It will flower if it has not enough nutrition. It will flower, here's another good one. It flowers all the time. If you harvest your color too early, say mid cycle, if you harvest it at four or five months and you oki and you replant, then it will throw flowers. And then the, the another big reason color flowers, and I see this a lot, when we do a kalohuki, I usually throw away all of my makua, yeah, which is um, which is this. This is the makua, and this is the oha, this little tiny thing, right? And everyone wants the biggest huli ever, so they take all the makua, and and me and my friends, we just kind of giggle because you know these guys walking home with giant bundles, puolo of huli, and we just giggle because usually we we give those back to the aina, and we tell each other, hey. This guy, you can grow plenty of flowers, huh? Because the first thing you do when you replant a makua is it will throw tons of pua. And that's because, you know, the way it was taught to us was that, you know, mama gave her life already for, for producing this giant eel that filled your whole bowl with poi. And now you're going to ask her to do it again. Yeah? Shame on Mahi Ai for doing that. If they, if they need to, I understand. If you can afford not to, Please don't, because that's like asking a kupuna to go and have another baby, right? And give their all to, and kupuna do that. When the family needs it, kupuna do raise the next generation, um, but kalo will, will have a hard time with it. You'll never get a big quorum off of replanting a makua. It will always be smaller and smaller and smaller. And so um, if you need to, you can. Here's what I recommend. Just take your knife. And what you should do is make a little line in your huli. If it's a makua and not a oha, if it's a parent and not a keiki, right? You want to make a little line in your huli. Right there on the bottom of your huli. And then you replant it. You pull out that next generation. If you really, really have to, you're going to look at the bottom of the corm and see that line on the mole of the, of the eel. And when you see that line, you'll say, oh, this was a makua last generation. Oh, man. But I need this variety. It's my last one. I got to replant it. Okay, no problem. Okay, what you got to do is you just got to mark it again. And then it will look like this. Okay, you put another line on it. And when you harvest the color and it has that X on it, time to give it back to the Aina. Yeah, no more than two generations after that. So you can go with maximum three generations. But if you can afford it, just replant the biggest Oha. That will give you the biggest corm for production. Um, anyway, that came from how does it flower? A lot of reasons it can flower. Sometimes it's a, it's a sign to tell you something. Sometimes it's just because it wants to, and that's okay too. Yeah, good question. We have one more question. Um, how do you know when it is ready to harvest? This one is from Lori. Lori, how do you know when the color is ready to harvest? That's, that's probably one of the most common questions I, I get. And it is a valid question. Uh, most people don't like my answer, though, because there is no standardized answer. 
Um, some plants in, in Hawaii, there's a standard answer to when they're gonna be hua and ready to, to harvest. Kalo is an exception to that rule. Um, it will depend on multiple factors. It will depend on your variety. Plants like manaulu, manaopelu, manauliuli, they'll, they'll ripen around sea level in, in, a, in a pretty, you know, semi-dry spot at around six months. Um, you take it up to, to Ola'a, that same variety will harvest, will harvest mana ulu and mana opelu at like almost a year sometimes because it's just not much. At higher elevations, they mature slower. And then you have varieties like, you know, the famous La'aloa that can stay in the ground for two years without, without palahu or palahe, without rotting. Um, so it, yeah, well, my, my answer is it depends. And, and there's a few ways to know when your color is ready that are more accurate than just gauging a timeline that you've read in a book. Um, best way to know, you're gonna see the color peak out of the ground, right? The color natural growth pattern will grow real tall. And then slowly it starts to send that energy back into the EO and it will shrink, 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 shrink. And then as it shrinks that EO, the corm will pop up out of the ground a little bit. When that corm starts to pop up out of the ground, you can either A, mound it so that it, that corm stays hidden from the sun because um, you don't want the sun exposed to that, or you can harvest it. And if you don't harvest it, it will become loli loli really fast. So that's one way to know. Second way to know is you just pull one and you can do two things. You can take your knife and stick it in the mole, right? Stick it in the bottom of this, this corm. And if your knife goes in a little bit and it's hard to get in more, it's pa, you harvest it at a good time. And if you push it in and it goes, it slides in really easily, it means that your corm is mostly sugars and it's lowly and it's overripe. So that's one way. Another easy way to do it is to take all of the corms, the eel, and throw it in a pakini, in a, in a tub full of water. And if the kalo sinks, it's my kai. If it floats, you waited too long to harvest. Go back, take notes about what month that was, how long it was in the ground, and then you can adjust to that. Yeah. So there's multiple ways to know how to, what time to hookie. And every variety and every place is different. Yeah. Awesome. If you harvest too early, um, can you put it back in? If you harvest too early, no, no, you gotta read, <laughs> you gotta cut it. Yeah, you know, can stick them back in. Although there is a, a mo'olelo of a kohala planting method of people starting the kalo up in the mountains and then digging them up mid cycle and bringing them down to the kai to finish their maturing. But I've never been able to verify how to do that. But there is there is one mo'olelo about that. So, um, yeah. And then the last one, we haven't had a chance to make a mala yet. Is it okay to start kalo in a, pl a, a pot? Yes, it is okay. A few things you need to know about kalo in a pot. Kalo is a heavy, heavy eater, just like us as kanaka, right? We love our food. It's a high nutrient consumer. And so when you're growing in a pot, it's limited to, to how much nutrients it can draw from that pot. Um, so you have to have a really mean mixture in there for it to be able to survive of, of organic material or broken down composted uh, material. Second thing, color likes drainage. So if it's in a pot, it has to have cinder mixed in, um, black cinder as much as you can. Third thing is that if the pot is outdoors, which, you know, and, and exposed to full sun, the color will struggle no matter what because the sun cooks the black pot or whatever pot you're growing it in and it cooks the outsides of the roots. So as the color roots get to the edge of the pot, they get seared, essentially they get fried. So you have to double insulate your pots, which is the most efficient way we found of growing color. And that is to say you plant color in a, in a pot and then you, get a, you buy a little bit bigger pot and you put that pot in a pot and insulate it with sphagnum moss, um, whatever you have to insulate it, you know, so that the sun will heat that almost like a hydro flask, right? You, you preserve the inside to keep a, a normal temperature. Um, that's one way to grow big kalo in a pot as well. Yeah. What does it mean if my kalo has runners? Well, it means that it's probably not Hawaiian. Although we do have kupuna kalo that will run on occasion. Some of our maninis will run, some of our manas will run. I've seen a pico run. Um, I've seen... And like I said, all kalo, if not paid attention to, will go back to its original state of, of having runners. And so if it has really long runners, I don't think it's Hawaiian. It's most likely from 
The Philippines, Manalad has really long runners. Our Palawan varieties have long runners. And so um, what it means if they're really long is that you should pull it out and get rid of it. But because there are invasive kalo in Hawaii, people don't realize that you know planting the wrong kalo, it will take over your whole mala. Like that purple Filipino manalad, there's multiple manalad varieties, but you could mow that thing over with a lawnmower and it will grow back even more vigorous. And it, it, I've seen it absolutely take over mala. It's not a very good tasting kalo. The low is high in calcium oxalate, the itchy crystals that, that scratch your throat if you don't cook it long enough. Um, so I would say that, you know, if they're short runners, can, real short, can. If they're long, more better you just know, know grow that variety. Go get, there's so many other good varieties available. I would go for those, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's normal. That's why I, I tried to teach you guys to identify your color varieties because most often when, when I ask people, oh, you know, who do you grow or what variety are, are you you're working with? The reply is the green one or the red one. I'm like, oh, wonderful. Okay, we can narrow that down to, you know, 75 color. And, um, and so, yeah, it's important to know who we're growing, right? To me, that's like calling my kid, you know, the tall one or the short one, yeah? Or the dark one and, and the light one. I, I, that's just a weird way to think about our, our miyakanu. And so knowing their names is, is, is critical, yeah? And, and there are, to your credit and, and my, to everyone's credit, resources are limited. The kupuna that have that knowledge aren't available in the community always. The, the books that have that knowledge aren't clear. There's no pictures. They're very vague. Bulletin 84 is all scientific words that I took forever to learn. Like, what the hell does pedio mean? Oh, that's the ha. Okay, why they never just put ha, right? Or ovate and sagittate, or all these angles. Like, bro, I had to go learn math. I had to go learn all these things to, to figure out how to be a mahi'ai and read what these varieties should look like. And so, um, yeah. Anyway, I don't know how I got on that tangent. But ku and hina style, yeah. So the ku style is to kanu your huli facing east, yeah, facing the rising sun. This natural point in the huli faces the rising sun. That's ku. And that ku style allows this lao to open up first thing in the morning, yeah, um, and catch that, that sun real bright. And it shades the corn from the oha. So you produce less oha and bigger corn, bigger eo. And when you plant them hina style, we talked about laying it down, but you can also face this point to the setting sun. And what that will do is it'll allow the sun in the morning to come up and these oha will come out and catch the sun first. And so you'll get more oha and a smaller eo, uh, which for rare varieties, we really, we really do like, we practice that a lot. Yeah, so um, I think that's what, you're, that's what you're talking about. For producing more leaf or more corn, for producing more leaf, in the ku style, you'll get bigger leaves, is what I'll say, but not as many. And then in the hina style, it's smaller leaf, but more. So if you're that person who likes to layer all the little lao in your lao lao and wrap them and fold them into your bowl, then plant them hina. And if you like just a few big lao, do it ku style. Yeah. Um, and since we're on luau gathering, let's go and uh, break down how to gather luau. So one way, just choke waves you can i don't care how you you can use a knife you can use whatever you want the easiest way that i do it is i look at the the color and i look for the the newest shoot this one right here this is the youngest leaf right here okay it's the most tender it just unrolled um, unraveled the new leaf hasn't come out of it yet this is what we call the number one leaf so when you gather luau and you can eat the ha too i'll show you how to do that in a little bit when you gather luau, if you're just going for luau, the easiest way to gather it is to take these three fingers. Yeah. And you stick your thumb in the pico, right here in the pico. And then you stick these two fingers behind the lao. And all you're doing is you're snapping up and pulling off. And what that creates is a perfect lao that's already de ribbed on the back. You left it on here. Okay. A lot of people will go back and cut this with a knife. 
Um, and that's your softest luau. It will break down the fastest in your pot. And then the second would be the number two leaf. And then number three, if you have to. But please leave number four or five. And if there's six on there, leave number six so that the plant can still photosynthesize and, and it, won't, it won't disrupt your, your corn harvest. And I think we talked about it maybe in the last class, but um, you can harvest up to three times a year. I'm sorry, a cycle, your ha. And oh, hello, my. we can harvest up to three times. So what I usually do is like three months or four months, and then maybe six months, you can harvest your luau again, leaving some on, just taking one or two off each plant. And then you can harvest again at um, when you when you hookie your kalo without stunting the corn. Anything more than that, you're gonna you're gonna risk stunting the corn pretty bad. And and that's okay if you're just going for luau. But please don't practice what a lot of other people practice in like they bolo head the whole plant one time. I think it's important um, to to leave some of those solar panels on for the plant to to still thrive. Um, and for the ha, I just took a section of the ha here. I like to put it in my lau lau. I put it in my luau stew. Sometimes you just make ha ha stew. And all you do is you cut the ha and you got to peel them like celery. Yeah? So you just take them and you just peel off the skin, the ili, because this is where all of the calcium oxalate resides, a lot of it. And so it'll cook down easier once it's peeled. You just peel all the sides and then you can chop it up and throw it in your lau lau or your luau. Yeah. Wow, please keep coming. Yeah, keep them coming. It's okay. Any new ones? Yes, we do. We have it's um from Moibai. It's getting sunny and hot. Do you have any mulching and watering techniques? Yeah. Um, so for my mala, we we mulch heavily. And it's not a traditional mulch, but it's what works efficiently for us. And there is this cool concept of use what get, right? That, that, that my friend taught me from, from Puna. And using what you have available is important, but you know, the ideal mulch is one that will last a long time because you know, we've mulched with la'i, we've mulched with kukui, we've mulched with all of these other plants, but they break down so fast in Hawaii. And so what I would say is that we use vetiver grass, and if, and, and if you don't know what vetiver is, it, it's okay, um, but, but it's a nice clumping grass. We chop and drop that in our, in, our, in our fields because we have them on the sides of all of our fields. And when we grow kalo, there's extra nutrients in that soil after we harvest, and the, the vetiver will suck it up and will chop the vetiver grass, reapply it as mulch, and it's a way of nutrient cycling, right? And so... Vetiver grass is good in Hamakua because it takes about six months before it starts to um, degrade and, and, and fall apart. And so we, um, we prefer that because I'll mulch it one time in the beginning and then I won't ever have to go back to reapply mulch until I hooky. And, and so that's what we use, but um, definitely apply a heavy layer of mulch. Sometimes you have to wait for the kalo to throw a few leaves to throw the mulch because if your huli is small, it'll get buried in that mulch and you don't want to do that. So um, yeah, mulching is critical. Watering, it all depends on your environment. We cheat, we have drip line on our mala. Um, it really produces a really nice size EO and really healthy kalo. And that goes on like every few days. So um, yeah, watering depends. How big is your mulch tree? So yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I've never measured it. I would say about you know five inches, if your huli is big enough, because depending on how fast that mulch breaks down, you want to give it you know a buffer so you're not having to rethrow mulch every time. So, but you're, if if you're in a wet area, you don't need too much mulch. You just need enough to keep the weeds down, yeah, until the kalo can grow. Once the kalo hits about four months, it should be big enough to shade out the the, the understory, and it's okay if your mulch disappears at that point, yeah. Good question. Any other questions before we, we move on and transition into Alba? We'll go through Alba really quick so that we can hit more questions at the end. Because the questions to me are, are more on the, how much time do we have? 25 minutes. Okay. Um, can we take a break? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, why don't we take a, a, 
five minute break and then we can come back in that break go walk to your mala if you're there at home if you're at school look in your mala and come back with more questions and we'll try to answer them we, we may not be able to answer everything but we'll talk about what we can and, um, but yeah come back with more questions and we'll transition a little bit into avan and that that will be it um, for this this papa and um, yeah five minute break don't forget to come back huh? yeah okay Allah. Let's move on in the in the presentation. We're gonna talk about so in the first class we, we really surface level talked about kalo, maya, wala, and ko. And so if you have questions about those two, like feel free. That that's we can talk about some of that. But I also thought it was important to cover um, a kupuna crop that we haven't talked about yet, a really important medicine for our people. And so that's what we'll talk about. Ava or Piper Bethisticum is a is a black pepper species. You guys know black pepper. It's, uh, it's in the same ohana as black pepper. And it's, uh, it's a crop that was brought across the Pacific. And every island that it stopped on, it became more and more refined. So if you go back to um, Papua New Guinea, you'll find an ava species-ish called Piper uh, which is the predecessor to the Piper methysticum we have today. And that plant is, it looks like ava, but on steroids. Like the thing is just like, it boosts and you can't drink it. It's not, it's kind of toxic to the body. And then as it came across Vanuatu, Fiji, into Samoa, Tonga, it became more and more refined. Um, meaning, and, and the way I relate this to people is not in an ethnocentric like mindset. It's just, it, it's also very scientific and true that Hawaii ended up having some of the best plants and varieties uh, ever across the Pacific. And for the simple mana'o that if you were to leave Kahiki and you were coming to Hawaii, would you not bring your most favorite and cherished varieties that existed? And if the answer is yes, then wouldn't that be the same all the way across with every voyage until you got to this place where you had brought the best of the best? And that's what ended up happening here. And, and we'll show you scientific proof in a little bit on this slideshow of, of why we know that's true for Ava. So Hawaii got the best ava in the world, like really. Not, not, and by, what I mean by best is most medicinal. I'm not talking about most powerful because what we're not looking for in a good ava is something that will put you on your butt, right? Like they have in, in Vanuatu, they extract it with, with the vali from the hau um, in, in Micronesia. We're, we're talking about a real pure one that can connect you and, and perform the relaxation and, and la'au that it's supposed to do in your body. So um, real quick, we'll, we'll run through some of the ava identification, propagation, cultivation. We won't talk about the mutation too much. And then we'll go into some of the la'au uses after that. There's many different versions of how ava ended up in Hawaii. Um, there are, you know, the most common one I think is kani and kanaloa, sent it down from the lani um, or came across the, the moana nui with it. But there's all of these other versions that are just a glimpse of how um, of how Ava arrived in Hawaii. Yeah, this is at my friend's um, hale. This is a little plant he drew that has all the the mahele, the little different parts of the Ava plant, and uh, it goes from the pua, right, that little flower that is sterile, they say, into the lau, in different parts of the lau with the pico. Um, into the aka and the pu'u pu'u that are on, on the, to the pona, which are the nodes, uh, to those makas that come out of the stems, to the opu, which is the pu of the ava, which is consumed, and in the a'a, which are also consumed, and the niho pu'a. You can also consume the niho pu'a. The niho pu'a are the new shoots of ava that actually look like pig tusk. You can see them when they come out of the ground, they look like the tusk of a pig. And so what you can cons consume on an ava plant healthily is anything below this first node of the plant. Anything above it is toxic to the human body. Everything below it is good for human consumption. It goes from an amazing medicine to a toxic plant in the same realm, yeah, which is interesting. Um, all right, Ava identification. The first thing you're gonna look at when you identify Ava is how does it stand? Just like Kalo, right? Some of our Laoloa and Manini families stand real tall, some of our moi, um, our, our other, you know, more relaxed ohana, our kais are a little bit shorter, a little more relaxed. 
And then we have our, our apu wai, our, our apu, our pe'ele'i, our pa'akai that kind of cup their leaves and stay real short, yeah? Same with the ava. We have ava that grow real tall into the trees. Ava hiva is one of them. Ava ne ne, real tall. Uh, opihikao, real tall. And then we have our ava that are more medium, yeah? Ava mo'i, a little more crinkly in the, in the, the growth. And then we have our real relaxed, real low and growing papas, like our papas, our papa kea, papa ele ele, papa ele ele pu'u pu'u. Um, ava pana eva on occasion, ava pana eva can also grow tall. These are some of the, the, the stem cuttings that, that you can see from the different varieties. Not all, but a lot of the varieties that exist. So one way to classify them is how long the internode is inside in between node to node, what the nodes look like, are there spots, are there pu'u pu'us or lentisoles where there, uh, you can feel the bumps, yeah? Some ava, you can be blind and still know which ava variety it is because you can feel the, the occurrence of how, how prevalent those, those bumps are. Uh, are they long internodes, are they short? Are they black, are they green? Do they start with green, but then have a per little bit of purple at the knuckle? Yeah, where, where are they? Somewhere on that scale. These are the internodes. These are the leaf shapes. A lot of the picos have different colors. There's two main families, the green or yellow pico family and then the, the purple picos, yeah? Here's an old ava patch that my, my friend uh, found. These are some of the names of the anokalo. And, and more than getting caught up on names and varieties necessarily, I think it's important to know that ava mutates just as often, if not more than Kalo. And so we've seen Mo'i turn into Avahiva, right? We've seen Honokaneiki elongate and turn into Mapulehu and, and vice versa. We've seen some of these mutations occur. We believe that Ava came over in maybe just two-ish waves, two introductions of two different varieties. Um, whereas Kalo, we probably had multiple migrations of introductions to Hawaii. And so, a lot of these will trace back genetically to the same source when you're looking at Ava. So just know that it can fluctuate and mutate really easily. Here's one that, that is beautiful, Hanaka Pi. Most of our Ava hold names to places they were rediscovered because we cannot find a ton on matching them up well with, with traditional names. Some of them we, we, we were able to, but for this one, uh, Joe Lau, who got a lot of our Ava from the, the valleys, Found this in, in Hanaka Pi'ai on Kauai, and it's a beautiful plant. Look at the node there. Hiva, uh, this is a really popular one. This is the one you, you cast into the Luapele for your Hokupu. Uh, this is the one that they say the gods preferred. And this is one that really induces dreams. When, when, when I drink Ava Hiva to, to heal from a hard day of Mahi'ai, and I don't drink Ava the next night, that night, the kupuna really come in the dreams. Um, you really connect. Your moi uhane become very uh, vibrant, yeah? And so uh, this is a really good one to, to connect to kupuna. And um, it's a beautiful, it's, a, it's our darkest black ava and, and our tallest growing sometimes. All right. This one is honokaneiki. Honokaneiki is another one that was found in the valley near Pololu. And it was found in a lot of other places too. We, we just found Honokaneiki in Laupohehoi Nui, which is the gulch or the, the Avava, the valley right after Waimanu. So Waipio, Waimanu, Laupohehoi Nui. It was in one of those veins right there. Beautiful little striations, these stripes on the, on the nodes. Kumakua. This one was rediscovered in Kalapanna. Mahakea. This is an old one. We have the name for it and the variety. Um, Mahakea is a ka'u term for this variety, but it's also known as ma'akea, ma'akea. There's a lot of variants to that word. Also mentioned in a lot of our early oli. Mapulehu, this is one found, named and found um, after the place it was found in Wailau on Moloka'i. Mo'i, traditional name. It, it has reference to uh, the ali'i who preferred this variety. This is the, the ava that uh, Kamehameha drank at his war council on Moloka'i, where they didn't invite Ka'iana, uh, another story for another time, to that meeting. And they were, it's a good strategizing, right? To, to receive inspiration and strategize and have clarity of thought 
right, in order to get things done and accomplished. So good for you, modern day, good for your work meetings, good for uh, being able to, to come up with I new ideas. Yeah. This is Nene, Ava Nene. This is one that, that I give an upu to my kids when they have, when they take a really late nap and they wake up at like four or five, right? And we, we got to go bed by eight or nine. So one apu of Ava Nene and it, Pukui said it will cure the fretful child. It will take the edge off. It will induce sleep a little bit better uh, for them while still giving them clarity of mind. Um, Ava Nene. Kua ea is the other term for it. Opihi kao. This was a really special variety and this rediscovery from, from Puna. So this is named after the, the ridge that it was found on in, in, in Opihi kao, on the way to Kalapana. And Uncle Jerry was actually responsible for, for finding and saving this variety. He, he, was, he was hiking, he found it on a ridge, and luckily he took some cuttings because when he went back a few months later, this variety, along with the other varieties it was standing next to, were gone. Someone had came and, and harvested them, which is the norm for Avo. Avo was a highly marketable beverage uh, in, from the, I would say from the 70s through the early 2000s, where people were bulldozing into forests, digging up Avo plants with a backhoe, selling it on the market to Germany, who were buying it up in bulk to make tinctures and all kinds of things. And they weren't replanting. And so we lost the bulk of our, our varieties back then. Um, Panaeva, this one was also found in Panaeva. They tried to initially name it short internode green, which we see is problematic because there's purple in there and that's just a lame name. So the Kupuna and Panaeva said, no, 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 let's name it after Panaeva. Uh, Papa Ele Ele Pu'upu'u, this one is beautiful, it's so on. No. Papa Ele Ele, these two, Papa Ele Ele Pu'upu'u and Papa Ele Ele we use for, um, as la'au for bladder infections, for um, yeah, any kind of any kind of uh, liver issue or kidney issue. So they say a variant for Papa Ele Ele is is Luukia after Luukia Queen Luukia from Waipio. This was found in her Aba patch, but we think it's a little bit different than Papa Ele Ele. So we just got to keep an eye on it. I have them both growing in my mala. Papakea, this is the one that got me through college. Um, Papakea is really good for those with uh, ADHD. It helps you to, to focus in on one thing as opposed to all, all the different stimuli going on in your brain and the synapses firing in spots you're not supposed to. It just wants that, it just it zones you back in. I could, I could have a kanoa of Papakea, start my 30 page research paper. And by the time the kanoa is empty, the paper is pow and it's like, I'm like, bro, who wrote this? Like, you know, like this is the most amazing paper I ever seen. Um, so for me, now what's cool about Ava is that there's there's six main cavalactones. And when these cavalactones appear in different variations and different potencies in every variety, and according to where they're grown, that's what gives you the, the effects that you feel in your body, the relaxation, the clarity, uh, the the blood circulation that that occurs. So Ava is a great medicine for the farmer and the fisherman. If you work hard labor, construction nowadays, this is your plant because what I tell all of my people in my classes is Ava replaces like 10 different pills that howlers take medication for, right? And so it's your anti-inflammatory, anti-anxiety, um, it's your anti-insomnia, it's your blood circulatory, it's, your, it's just PTSD. I mean, everything that you can come up with um, that you could take pills for. Ava is really great for that. There are wonderful research papers coming out right now out of Europe, out of different universities that are showing the anti-cancer properties of Ava. Really cool studies done in Fiji where Ava was, um, there was a trial done where Ava was tested for its anti-lung cancer capabilities um, and, and smokers, while well, we're not endorsing smoking at all, it, it did prevent a lot of our, our, our smokers from, from getting lung cancer. Um, it's great for colon cancer. Uh, it, it prevents. Now, what I, won't say, what I will say is don't use it to treat. We have different lao for that. But you, it, it's a great preventative um, plant that, that, that allows your body to flush and, and clean out. 
we won't talk about today species. This is a cool uh, test that I, that I do just for fun that basically shows you the purity of ava. And what, what I did here was I tested different avas that I had just in, in my fridge or lying around the house from different places. And, and this is ava nene from Hawaii, the one that traditionally we know was given to kids. And what's interesting is it came out the most pure, the most noble, I guess you could call it in, in ava terms. And all you're doing is you're adding a little bit of ava with a little bit of acetone and it extracts the ava and shows you the color purity of that ava. And they're all in baby jars because we had babies at the time. And my beautiful white sheet is a background. Um, then we have ava hiva from Hawaii, which is kind of our strongest ava for Hawaii. And it's still very noble, very pure, very translucent amber, but still a little bit more cloudy than you see in ava nene. This is the ava I got from Aotearoa from a friend. And you can see that it's not a very clean ava. And if you're putting this kind of ava in your body, whether it's you know that purchased bag from the store or whatever it is, you're already looking at a whole different thing that you're, you're putting into your body. Your liver's working harder to process it. Um, your bladder's struggling a little more. And then you're looking at Isa, which is a two-day variety, which is kind of the most common ava variety I see in Hawaii. If your ava is growing ridiculously vigorous way too fast, it's either A, not ava, it's a, a false ava species, or it's probably Isa. And this is one that was not consumed ever in Hawaii and rarely in other places, um, usually in times of mourning um, only. And so you can see how that's really not very pure at all. It contains a component in, in it that we think is toxic for your liver. We don't know, we think, called flavocabin B. It was one that Dr. Lebo was able to isolate to show um, that it was different than our ava that we grow in Hawaii. But anyway, this is not as important. This is the ISA plant. All right, this is important though. Uh, Piper annuum. So th this is this is important to know. This ava is growing everywhere, and it's not ava. We call it fool's gold. Uh, it's it's false ava, highly invasive, like a super invasive species. It, it took over entire valleys on the road to Hana. When you're going to Hana, you'll see entire valleys, right? One whole valley covered in invasive ohe, invasive bamboo. Another whole valley covered in in invasive ironwood. Next valley, invasive, covered in this false ava. It took over the whole valley. Um, you'll see it all around the place. So yeah, this is one you don't want to plant. If you And the way to tell this ava apart is this mid-rib vein down here in false ava. All of the secondary veins come off of this mid-rib vein. In true ava, all the lines go back to the pico. Let's see if we can get a picture. All of these veins go back to the pico rather than coming off that mid-rib vein. Does that make sense? So on true ava, all of the veins will trace back to the pico. On the false ava, they trace back to this mid-rib. The flowers are longer. They propagate through stolons or runners. And that's, how I, well, that's what makes it so uh, invasive. There's no cavalactones, no medicine. Um, stay away from it. This is a dangerous plant for our, our malas. And just is just to, to show you that there's other ava species that exist that are not um, ava as we understand it. So this one is from Aotearoa. They use the leaves for tea sometimes, but yeah, mostly it's not it's not not consumed. So traditional propagation of ava is they would take the branches of the ava plant, lay them down, and set a pohaku or a stone on top of them. Those plants would grow, and then they could harvest the, the plant that they've laid down. And so what you start to do is you start to form these rings around your initial plant, yeah? And, and it creates a, a perpetual ava harvest. There is some evidence that shows that our kupuna weren't even harvesting entire plants at a time altogether, that they were harvesting just one root because the ava they were growing were 30 years old. So they would go up and just harvest one massive root and bring that down and consume that rather than digging up the whole plant. Nowadays, we're battling white fly. We're battling shot hole fungus uh, virus, um, which is called FOMA. We're battling root knot nematode, which kills your entire harvest. We're battling cucumber mosaic virus that the honohono grass is a host for, which grows in like everyone's garden sometimes. And um, that will kill your entire ava plant, cause, causes kava dieback. There's just tons of these different diseases that we're working with 
So we end up having to harvest at about anywhere from two to five years in order to save most of our plant before the nematodes consume it. And so a uh, little bit different than Vakahiko, but we can still get it done. This is my planting I just made last week with a class. Um, and this is my preferred method of planting ava at my farm, not my hale, but my farm. I like to give them a little shade with the new. The easiest way to do it is just to, to plant the ava and then give them a little hale individually with the lao new. I was just trying to get creative. I just want to show you um, my newest thing. But uh, ava needs shade when it's young. It prefers shade when it's young. And then you can remove the shade, part, the partial shade altogether as it grows up and expose it to the full sun. These are just some plants to avoid planting ava next to, either because they share pests or because the roots will infiltrate the ava root. And if you look here, what you're looking at is, is the, the new, the, the coconut roots planted too close. It was still far away, but still too close to the ava. The, the new, the coconut roots are those red roots. The ava are those light brown, whitish ones. So you can see how much of a nightmare that becomes when you harvest, yeah, to be able to separate them. So ava benefits. This was uh, from an ava harvest we had uh, a year or two ago where we uh, harvested tons of just healthy, vigorous plants. Uh, this is Hayden Pononui, Uncle Jerry's uh, grandson, Mopuna. So this Olelo no Eau is, is really, it, it kind of encompasses the entirety of what ava is and what it isn't, right? Dispelling the myths of ava are so critical to our people because, you know, the first people that wrote about ava were, were foreigners that were like John Mears and, and people who were visiting um, Archibald Menzies that were visiting Hawaii for the first time. And when they saw Ava, the, the only thing they had in their realm of understanding to relate Ava to was alcohol. And so in their books, they related Ava to alcohol. Nothing like it. Alcohol is an intoxicant. It's p low. It does not belong in the body of a Hawaiian or anybody for that matter. Ava is la'o, right? It's medicine. It's a relaxant. It allows the blood to flow to the muscles to heal them. It does not intoxicate or impair in any concept of, of the... Now, there is ways to abuse ava, right? You could drink a five-gallon bucket of it and, and not be in a good place. But when you're using it in the proper amounts at the proper times, it's la'o. It's medicine. And that's the most important thing. A relaxant versus a... Um, you, could, you could take, you know too many sleeping pills and be in a bad place too, right? So it's one of those things of knowing what the dose should be and then using it for the right purposes. Uh, there's no addictive qualities to ava, unlike alcohol. Um, you could not drink alcohol. You could drink, ava, you could drink ava for a month and not drink it for a week and not skip a beat, right? There's no headaches, there's no withdrawals. It's just, it's, it's not, there's no addictive qualities to it. And so this is a uh, olelo no eo that I love. Uh, and it's from, it's from Pukui, Tutu Pukui. She says, inu ava, he alaho inu koipa. So the kanaka or the person that drinks ava remains a kanaka, remains a person. Yeah? The person who drinks koipa, which is the, the transliterated word for swipe or alcohol in general, becomes a pua alaho. So you drink ava, you remain a normal, you know, in tune human being. You drink alcohol, you become a pua alaho. And what is a pua alaho for our people who are Hawaii? It's it, it is it could be literally what you what you see at transited ad, which is not, I'm not going to define it for you, but it also is the state of kamapua'a when he's in this phase of like hunting for wahine, and you can see how when you know kane especially drink alcohol, they become pua alaho sometimes. Yeah, um, see it at a bar, see it at a club where they're in this, this mode of hunting um, wahine. And so it's not a healthy thing for anyone to be consuming. Yeah, And it's interesting that our kupuna realized this back in the day when alcohol was first introduced and that this became an olelo no eel. Yeah. Here's some of the, the benefits of ava. There's so many more. This is just like a glimpse of, of what it can be used for. A uh, urinary tract infection is a really good one. Those papa ele ele is good for that as well. It's really good for boosting the immune system. When I get a cold or a flu, this is the thing that heals it the fastest for me. 
I just have a few apples of ava. You get your rest, the blood circulates better, anti-inflammatory, and you wake up feeling refreshed, like super, super maika'in, ready to work. 10 minutes, we're done. Okay. We're going to roll out of this. All right. Let's get questions. We have 10 minutes. I'm so sorry we went so long. Hope that was beneficial to you. Um, but yeah, let's get some, some good questions and I'll try my best to stay on topic and not get off topic to answer your questions um, in the chat or in your voice, whatever you want. Yeah, I'm sorry. I know it's a lot to process. <laughs> it's uh, For those of you who have like not even heard about Ava very much, like that was a lot. I understand. So uh, it could be anything Mala related. We could talk about Ko or Uwala if you have a question as well. So if our ancestors just ate, drank, consumed from that surface down under the ground, what did they really kind of do with everything above? What was the point of that plant? To replant. So everything, yeah. The leaves I use as mulch, the stems I replant. And Ava is amazing because when you prune it back a little bit, those low hanging branches to share the plant, it actually explodes the poo. It stores its energy in the root system even more. So by sharing the plant, you're doing yourself a favor. You know, it's, it's kind of an interesting, it's meant to share. The beverage is meant to share. The plant is meant to share. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what it was. Where's the best place to get Ava? In its processed form, kind of hard to come by. In its plant form, kind of hard to come by. Um, in its processed form, you can you can go to Hawaiian Gourmet Kava. They sell powdered um, Hawaiian Ava varieties. Um, that's my friend Chris Allen. You can go to uh, Pu'ohoku Ranch on Molokai. They have fresh frozen Ava and it's organic. Kanaka Kava, they're a bar in Kona. They're also a farm in Kalopa in Kaukamoli, and they... They have amazing organic fresh ava of all the Hawaiian varieties too. Um, so yeah, there's there's multiple places you can get the beverage. Now, if you're looking for, and I'm sorry, that's just Hawaii Island. I don't know too much about Oahu and there are people growing it, um, but yeah. And then the plant, I think you probably could buy it from like Uiku Mauliola. You could probably get plants from Waimea Valley Botanical Gardens. Um, yeah. The Pua Ava, I don't know. I have no clue. That's a good question. What can it be used for? I've never used it for anything. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I don't have an answer. You do workshops on Ava. Yeah, we do it all the time at the Kohala Center. We do um, Ava harvesting and processing workshops. We have a workshop in April, May, May coming up on, on Maui. For those of you that are, that are on Maui, We'll have an AVA workshop at the Maui Nui Botanical Gardens. We'll be doing an AVA identification workshop. And then we'll transition into the next day will be an AVA harvest and processing and sampling workshop um, if you want to join that one. So, yeah. Yeah, we talked about that at the pool. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what it can be used for. Um, Custer Swiss, bro, that, that, that plant is terrible. Growing all over our Ulu, my... Uh, any way to clear it out without hurting the poo might up? I don't know. That's a lot of work, hand sickle. Um, but no, I, I'm not sure. I'm so sorry. I can't. I, it's tough to to answer that question um, as well. All I do know is that is definitely a curse. What are the situations where people should drink? Um, shouldn't drink ava? Yeah. So yeah, good question. Yeah, if you're a hapai, you're breastfeeding. Um, you should not be having ava. Now, if you're talking about liver issues, that is a fallacy. That was, um, and we're actually working with the FDA right now to get AVA approved as a, as a supplement and beverage uh, because it is, so AVA was, was banned and outlawed in Germany because they gave that, that notion of liver issues to AVA because they had terrible ways of harvesting and consuming AVA. They were extracting AVA, not in the traditional way, right, with saliva or with water, they were extracting it with ethanol, alcohol, and they were, they were also buying up so much that they weren't quality controlling the ava. So Fijians, Vanuatu people, they were just, they were giving the stems, grinding up the leaves. They were sending everything they could to Germany because Germany was buying it. 
and they were extracting it and it was poisoning people's livers. And so when it's done in a traditional way, there's nothing to worry about. Your liver is perfect. Matter of fact, it's good for your liver. It can cleanse your liver. So, um, yeah. Yeah, good questions though. Yeah, but if you're hot pie and, and breastfeeding, I don't know why, but my kupuna always said, don't do not do it if you're breastfeeding or, or hot pie. So everyone else is welcome to drink ava and, and welcome to grow it. You know, if you want to monetize it, it's probably the most valuable crop you could invest in right now. Um, ava prices are through the roof. Uh, because there's, a, there's there's been a major shortage for years, but uh, more better you grow them for your own la'au and for your ohana to, to inu, yeah. But how's our time? Four minutes. Four minutes. We'll take one more question. Anyone have one more question? Mahalo for stay. You guys stayed the whole time. That's that's a big deal through a boring presentation. <laughs> yeah. One more question. Anything related to your, your mahalo? Hey, mahalo. Yeah, so I was trying to keep it simple. Sometimes it got a little not simple, but any questions on a, on a practical level of, of what you can do? I wish I had re more resources for where you guys could get it. If you're on Moku Kiave, come, come see me at the Kohala Center. We can get you Huli and Ava. We have a big Kalo Huki coming up in June or July, and we'll harvest you know the, the 100 plus varieties in we invite the whole community to come out and take all the huli they want home, all the kalo eo that they want home. We just we grow it to share it. We we don't sell. So, um, recommended books for growing ava, it would be kava. I think it's ava or kava in Hawaii, an ethnobotanical treasure. You can find a PDF of it on the Ava Development Council website, avadevelopmentcouncil.org. I think it's called. Um, and there's PDFs of that, of Titcom's Kava in Hawaii. It, that has a lot of traditional knowledge about Ava. Yeah, the Ava book, an ethnobotanical treasure is, is like a gem. A bunch of scientists and cultural practitioners came together to produce that, to give a well-rounded um, book. So that, that PDF is free online. Ava does kind of grow in certain climates, but you also, you can stretch the boundaries pretty far. Um, the higher you go, it does struggle. Um, anything above like four, four or five thousand, it probably would have a, an impossible almost time. Um, and then right on the sea spray, it struggles as well. It really loves to be next to rivers. Um, stagnant water will kill your ava really fast because of the root knot nematode. So drainage is critical. Uh, raised beds is nice for ava because it makes harvest easy. But if you do like a, a chicken wire or fencing with lined with weed mat and grow it in there, you can just unhook the the chicken wire or fence and, and your whole root is right there. You shake off the dirt. Um, so yeah, there's multiple ways to, to look into how to grow ava as well. We grow it in an agroforestry system as well. That does really nice. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, there we go. There's the survey. Hey, mahalo to everybody for, for, for coming out and, and staying for this, this session. If you want more information, uh, you can reach out to me via email or to the Koala Center, and we can uh, we can definitely we're always willing to share, 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 share. So outside programs for visit, yeah, we we host Huakai as well on our farm. We host school groups from all across the island, and um, from pre-K all the way up through you know college and, and professors. And so, yeah, feel free to to come out as well. But uh, my email is right here on the. The screen, kreynolds at koalacenter.org. Feel free to email me or get in touch with the Koala Center in general, and we can talk story. Uh, mahalo nui, and uh, get in your mala. Get a, turn the computer off and go get your hands dirty. Okay, ahui ho, everybody. Mahalo for coming. If you're um, around and free from 12 to 2, there's more sessions. There's going to be Aipono this afternoon. I think Lomi is happening. So check your access pass. And then tomorrow, come back. Um, we have sessions in the morning. 
And then we have um, Kei Kuhi, who's going to close us out with our um, closing keynote and we'll have a small uh, short panina. So please check your um, emails for surveys because we really appreciate the feedback. It helps us to plan for the future. So if you could take five minutes to do that, we really appreciate it. Mahalo, have a wonderful day.